This episode of CPP Cast is sponsored by Backtrace, the turnkey debugging platform that helps you spend less time debugging and more time building. Get to the root cause quickly with detailed information at your fingertips. Start your free trial at backtrace.io slash cppcast. CppCast is also sponsored by CppCon, the annual week-long face-to-face gathering for the entire C++ community. Get your ticket today. Episode 113 of CppCast with guest Sammy Barra, recorded August 9th, 2017. This episode, we talk about the CppCon 2017 schedule. Then we talk to Sammy Barra from Backtrace. Sammy talks to us about lesser-known synchronization primitives and the concurrency kit. Welcome to episode 113 of CPP Cast, the only podcast for C++ developers by C++ developers. I'm your host, Rob Bergen, joined by my co-host, Jason Turner. Jason, how are you doing today? Doing good, Rob. Uh, it's just a little bit of a disclaimer today that I am using a different setup, so if we have any audio problems or anything, I can be blamed. <laughs> yes, but we're, we're hoping it fixes some audio issues we occasionally have with you. Yes, we will see what happens. Yeah. So how was your, your DC trip? Uh, it was pretty good, interesting. Got to see some old friends. and uh, I, I don't know if we've talked about that trip at all uh, publicly here, but um, I, we I gave a short talk at Northrop Grumman and, and had a good time. Awesome. Okay, well, at the top of every episode, I'd like to read a piece of feedback. Uh, this week, we got an email from Vladimir, and he writes in, Hi, thanks for the show. I really enjoy listening to it during my commute. I wanted to make a comment on coroutines versus futures that you discussed on the last episode. The discussion was, under, <laughs> the discussion was under the assumption that Gore compared coroutines to futures directly and said futures had no future because of coroutines. But I don't think that's what he said. He compared futures to reactive, syst- reactive streams, which could be thought of as a generalization of futures, where a future is just one type of a stream that has just one element in it. Uh, Reactive streams have been getting a lot of traction across the industry in many different languages, and he uh, shared a link to ReactiveX.io. And it's really interesting because ReactiveX shows that it's uh, this framework that runs on multiple different languages, including C++. Interesting. Yeah, and it looks like uh, the main contributor to that for C++ has given a talk at CVPCon, so maybe we will try to get him on and dig into Reactive Streams a bit more. And I believe, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that we do have some updates on some Reactive Stream links that we could also add that we received in the past week. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay. Okay. Well, we'd love to hear your thoughts about the show as well. You can always reach out to us on Facebook, Twitter, or email us at feedback at cpcast.com. And don't forget to leave us a review on iTunes. Joining us today is Sammy Barra. Sammy is the co-founder of Backtrace, where he is helping build a modern debugging platform for today's complex applications. Prior to Backtrace, Sammy was a principal engineer at AppNexus, where he played a lead role in the architecture and development of many mission-critical components of the ecosystem. His work at AppNexus was instrumental in scaling the system to 18 billion impressions with orders of magnitude and efficiency improvements. Prior to AppNexus, Sammy was behind major performance improvements to the core technology at Message Systems, at the George Washington University High Performance Computing Lab, Sammy worked on the UPC programming language, heterogeneous computing, and multi-core synchronization. Sammy is also the founder of the Concurrency Kit project, which s- several leading technology companies rely on for scalability and performance. Sammy serves on the ACMQ editorial board. Sammy, welcome to the show. Yep, it's my pleasure to be here. Uh, what is the UPC programming language, if I might ask? Sure. So UPC is Unified Parallel C. There is, in fact, a UPC++ uh, that is also being worked on. Uh, As far as UPC is concerned, it is uh, a PGAS programming language that extends C99. Uh, More specifically, uh, sort of the core extension there is this notion of a shared qualifier, which allows... uh, 
a variable to be accessed uh, by a distributed system. So it's uh, same program, multiple data. You could have different. You could have the same instance of the program running on different machines, each accessing uh, a variable with a shared qualifier. Uh, it is, and by PGAS, what what that means uh, in this particular context is there is an explicit notion of locality, right? So it's not some you know oblivious global address space with with no notion of locality. It actually has strict semantics around locality, which allows for software developers to uh, make design decisions and uh, performance uh, design decisions around locality. So uh, I feel like generally in my world, if I'm going to talk about locality, I'm thinking like cache locality, like how close things are in physical system memory. But I'm getting the impression you're talking about like locality as in these distributed systems are geographically near each other. Yes, so this is locality in all senses. So it's uh, memory locality on uh, a single node, and then memory locality across nodes. So these could be located, in, uh, typically they'll be located uh, you know, somewhere else on a rack or another rack uh, entirely. Uh, for most high-performance computing applications, you tend to have uh, uh, you tend to use inter interconnects with much higher bandwidth and lower latency uh, guarantees than most commodity hardware. So typically over there, you are, you are at least uh, you know, in the same rack, per se, depending on the hardware that you're on. But regardless, that's obviously all significantly more expensive than uh, local memory access. Right. So, But in all cases, we're talking about um, reducing latency effectively. Uh, Reducing latency or improving uh, bandwidth, depending on the problem that you're dealing with. Okay. All right. Well, Sammy, it's great to have you on. Uh, we have a couple news articles to talk about, and then we'll uh, start digging into uh, your work at Backtrace and your recent talk at C++ Now, okay? Great. Okay, so this first one is that uh, Beast has been accepted into the Boost libraries. Uh, I've already also... We've talked about Beast a couple, quite a few times on the show and had uh, the author on a while ago, Vinny Falco. So it's great to see that he was able to uh, to get it accepted. Yeah, that's pretty big news. Yeah. Uh, there was one uh, comment on the Reddit thread here, which I thought was interesting. People were asking him if he's going to keep the name Beast, since it's kind of non-descriptive, um, instead of using something like Boost HTTP or Boost.socket. And uh, he actually pointed to a, a question on the Boost fact page about the decision to stick with Beast. I'm not sure if I completely agree, but uh, I thought it was interesting that he has thought ahead of that. I would um, at least maybe theorize that if it ever goes the standardization route, the name may change. Yeah, I don't see standard Beast really. That doesn't sound quite right. Yeah, maybe, maybe not. We'll see. But it is uh, exciting news for him, and I'm very curious, after everything else that we saw recently about the boost standardization process, for we're talking extremely tiny but controversial things, this is a much bigger and less controversial thing. Um, um, it would be interesting to, to get a window into how that process went. Yeah, maybe we should get him on again. Yeah. yeah. You have any thoughts on this one, Sammy? Uh, no, I do not. I'm I'm a, a neck beard through and through. <laughs> okay, uh, this next article is a summary of the meta class proposal, and this is coming from uh, Jonathan Bakara's blog, which is always really great. Uh, and he actually had this uh, reviewed by Herb Sutter, and it provided just a really good summary of all the work Herb Sutter has been proposing uh, for meta classes. Yeah, as always, well written article on yeah. Jonathan's blog. Yeah, so if you, if you hadn't had a chance to, uh, to watch Herb's video or, or read the actual proposal paper, I would highly recommend uh, reading this summary of the Metaclasses proposal by uh, Jonathan on Fluency++. I, I personally can't help but being left with the impression that Metaclasses is going to be like learning a new programming language. Yeah, yeah. Of course, how many it's people are really going to have to work with Metaclasses? That's what I'm also wondering. Uh, you know, 
things start out with crazy verbose syntax. They're esoteric and no one, you know, only the experts use them. And then mm -hmm. after a few years or a decade or whatever, the average programmer is throwing around templates when they need to. I mean, you know, it's, that's true. Um, it's, it's the specifically the const expert blocks that make me go, I have a difficult time reading this more than other parts. So yeah. we'll see though. Okay, next up is uh, C++17 in details file system, and this is on Bartex coding blog. And it's just a, a good uh, in-depth summary of the file system proposal that has been accepted in C++17. If you haven't read too much about uh, the, the file system proposal or if you haven't used Boost file system, this is a pretty good overview of uh, how it works and, and what you'll be able to do with it. I really like how you put that in in-depth summary. <laughs> Maybe not too in depth. But yeah, it's a good summary. It's definitely a great primer. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and then the the last exciting bit of news is the CppCon 2017 uh, schedule is out, and obviously you're in here a couple times, Jason. Um, Sammy, is anyone from Backtrace planning going to CppCon this year? Yeah, so Abel will be giving a talk at one of the open sessions. So Abel is a CEO and co-founder. Uh, he will be focusing on debugging technology, unsurprisingly. Uh, so if folks are interested in debugging technology, I do highly recommend it. There's another talk that also stood out to us. It seems very interesting. It's uh, from a bunch of folks uh, from Microsoft that are giving a talk on debugging large-scale commercial applications. Okay. So Abel's given a couple of talks on GDB, right, uh, that have been recorded and such. Uh, more on debugging technology. So, oh, debugging. Okay. Uh, we have talks on internals of debuggers, how they work, when they don't work, why they don't work, and what you can do about them. And then debugging at large. So if you're in a distributed system where you may have either thousands of servers running your code or hundreds of thousands of users or millions of users running your code and you have crashes, how do you how, how are you actually able to effectively triage, prioritize those issues and act on them? Uh, and there's a lot of interesting technology behind uh, be, uh, behind behind solving that problem. One of the things I wanted to call out in the CBPCon schedule is uh, Sarah Chips, who we had on a, a while ago talking about uh, Jewelbots, is going to be doing a talk on Friday. And, and not only is she doing this talk, which is titled Building for the Best of Us, Design and Development with Kids in Mind, but she's going to put on a workshop uh, so kids can get their hands on Jewelbots. So if you're going to the conference and you, you live in the Seattle area, then you could bring your kid along. And I think, you know, you don't need to pay a ticket entry for your kid. You can just bring them. Um, or if you make the CBPCon conference into like a family trip, you could bring your kids with you. But that's uh, something I think worth mentioning, too. Well, I mean, we haven't seen a lot of kids at CBPCon yet. Sure. But it'll be neat if we do. But also just on the topic of some of these more... Um, wider appeal sessions, the open sessions specifically, like Sammy was talking about, we've got, um, none of them have been announced yet because no one, you know, that's, there's no official schedule for them yet, I don't think. But the open sessions, yeah, they say TBA on the schedule. Yeah. Uh, anyone can come to, you don't have to be a registered right. attendee of the conference. So the open sessions tend to be in the morning and at lunchtime, and they're not recorded. Uh, but they're more kind of general content that people can propose later in the schedule. And, uh, yeah, anyone in the community who happens to be by can, can visit them or can submit their own talks. We had uh, that happen last year. Someone gave a talk who wasn't even attending the conference. Hmm. Okay. Well, Sammy, uh, let's get started with just talking about what exactly your role is at Backtrace. Sure. Uh, so I'm the CTO and co-founder, uh, primarily focus on product, engineering, and the technical roadmap of the company. So I make sure that our core technology is able to meet uh, the demands of Backtrace and our customers, make sure that uh, the engineering organization is able to get its job done effectively, so a facilitator of sorts. So how long have you guys been in business now? Uh, just over three years at this okay. point. Yeah. Okay. 
And you gave a talk at C++ Now uh, 2017 this year. Uh, and you talked about lesser-known synchronization primitives. Can you give us a, a bit of an overview of that talk? Yeah, sure. Uh, <clears throat> and you all, again, have to excuse me. I'm uh, currently in the middle of a terrible cough. <laughs> so I will likely cough a few times. Uh, <clears throat> so the talk was fairly broad. It covered uh, things uh, from you know, basic atomic instructions, hardware support for concurrency, uh, touched on topics around memory management and advanced uh, data structures. Uh, all these primitives either help with performance, reliability, or reducing program complexity. Uh, so as far as the primitives are concerned, uh, you know, these are things that are not exposed by the standard library or by the language standard uh, itself. Uh, for atomic operations and hardware support, for example, there's a, quite a notion of decrement and set if zero operation, which is a, a very common thing for reference counting, right? You decrement a reference count and you want to make sure that it's zero. Uh, there is a fetch and add operation, but uh, even if you're simply checking for uh, uh, a value of one, this will always compile down to a suboptimal instruction sequence uh, with all C++ compilers that I have tested. So this does have uh, implications on latency if you have some heavy reference counting code, and it does have implications on the instruction cache. Uh, then, of course, there's also all sorts of other interesting extensions. Uh, so, for example, Intel recently released uh, an instruction that allows read for ownership. So it allows finer grain control over cache coherency. Uh, so a modern processor today obviously has a cache coherency protocol, which uh, ensures uh, uh, consistency of memory on the system. Uh, and uh, this the cache currency protocol itself can be a significant bottleneck for a lot of classes of applications. Uh, and if you don't, uh, if you're not careful with regards to how your parallel program is reading and writing to memory, uh, you will have suboptimal performance. So a very common pattern, for example, is to read from a region of memory and then subsequently write to it. <clears throat> and in that situation, uh, you end up generating unnecessary cache currency cycles. So a very common pattern in uh, modern uh, programs, for example, is to read a region of memory and then write to it. Uh, this does end up generating uh, cache currency traffic, which can be fairly expensive. So now you have the ability to actually read a region of memory, but uh, indicate the intent of writing to it. So rather than having two cache currency cycles, you will only have one. Uh, and then, of course, there are other very interesting things like Intel's recent, uh, well, recent uh, support for restricted transactional memory, uh, which allows you to do all sorts of uh, interesting things for concurrent data structures that are, uh, that have uh, data parallelism. Uh, as Anything on, on, so that was sort of the first segment. Happy to sort of dive into that further. Yeah, I have a, a couple of questions, yeah, before we move on, I think. Um, you, uh, so atomics are kind of essential to lock-free programming, I guess, but there is still, they're not free, right? If something is an atomic operation, it's still going to have to cause all of the cores to at least agree that we're all, you know, that something is being operated on an atomic way, right? Yeah, I mean, this depends on the underlying memory model and uh, sort of the concurrency requirements of the algorithm being developed, and then the patterns of memory axes that are being made. So if you're using a uh, a true, you know, read, modify, write atomic operation on x86, for example, yes, that is extremely expensive in the sense that you are serializing, uh, you're effectively serializing the pipeline. Uh, okay. So there is a real cost, even in the absence of shared memory axes. Now, if there are shared memory axes, things obviously get even more expensive because you have all this cache currency traffic, you have all this... Uh, 
uh, chatter that's going on between processors, and that in itself will have other impacts. Not only do you have increased latency, because now you're going off uh, the core that you're on or the memory controller that you're on, uh, but you also have uh, the potential for uh, uh, increased uh, latency due to congestion over the interconnect. Uh, now, if you do constrain the complexity of your algorithms, uh, in many cases you can get away with using uh, uh, loads and stores which uh, are atomic on x86. Um, so if you don't have shared uh, memory axes or you don't have actively mutated shared memory, uh, then uh, those loads and stores are practically free. Interesting. So uh, you, we keep uh, bringing this around x86, but I, a fair number of people are using ARM for, well, I mean, lots of work these days. Do you have any experience with how these things impact a multi-core ARM? Yeah, I mean, it's all the same principles. Okay. Uh, so ARM is uh, has a much more relaxed memory ordering model. It is relaxed memory ordering. Uh, so for the purposes of correctness, uh, rather uh, the developer has to explicitly emit uh, fences or ensure that uh, the appropriate acquire release uh, qualifiers are added to the atomic operations. Those end up serializing things. Okay. So you did uh, briefly start to mention uh, transactional memory, and I'm curious if you have at all followed the transactional memory standardization stuff that's been discussed with C++. Yes, so uh, I have looked at that. Uh, I did not have any uh, real thoughts around this. I think the, the extensions uh, seem sane. Okay. Uh, yeah, and, and no, no real thoughts beyond that. There was nothing really uh, novel about it. It was uh, very logical, I thought, and, and, and well thought out. And, uh, you know, one thing I really did like was, uh, you know, there was this emphasis on, uh, how can I say, exposing composability of transaction of uh, data structures, which are suitable for uh, restricted transactional memory via the type system, uh, and I thought that was a, you know, a clever way of, of dealing with that problem. You know, the more general question I have is, you know, how relevant will RTM be, restricted transactional be, outside of, uh, so far, uh, Intel and uh, power architectures? So I, I had seen a couple of comments from people that were something along the lines of, like, transactional memory, I thought that went out in the 90s and we gave up on that. And now to hear that Intel is adding instructions to support it and we're talking about its standardization in C++, it's not a topic I'm terribly familiar with in the first place. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think transactional memory went out of fashion uh, in the context of... Uh, you know, hard transactional memory. So transactional memory where we, you have guarantees of forward progress. Uh, and there's a lot of uh, trade-offs there, uh, and there are a lot of issues just around feasibility. You know, actually what performance advantages are, to, are there to that model, uh, and what are the advantages to simplicity when you don't necessarily always have, uh, you know, transparency around things like contention. Restricted transactional memory, on the other hand, is a lot more, is a lot simpler. So restricted transactional memory, as exposed by uh, uh, Intel and power, uh, does not guarantee forward progress. So it is best effort. You essentially mark a region of executable code as uh, you know, executing in the context of a transaction and uh, you write to memory, you can read from memory, and then you commit. If any of the regions of memory you uh, interacted with are, are uh, conflicted by, uh, if there are conflicts in those regions of memory from other threads, for example, reads or writes, that transaction will abort and you're forced to retry. Okay. Uh, and because you don't have those forward progress guarantees, simply you do have to ensure that you do have a fallback path that's built on blocking synchronization. 
And that's, you know, that's sort of the driving principle behind lock elision, which leverages transactional memory. Right? So lock elision will essentially uh, align a set of locks, uh, elide lock acquisition, so as if the lock uh, and unlock operations were no ops, and treat them as uh, you know, transactional memory sections. And if, as long as there are no conflicts, it'll go through without uh, really uh, introducing any contention to other lock holders. Uh, but if there are conflicts, then you retry, and then you actually have to acquire the lock. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I, I do touch on this in more depth uh, in the slides, so check right. that out. And then there's also a whole bunch of t uh, other stuff I talked about. So uh, other one is synchronization primitives. So these are alternatives to traditional condition variables, mutexes, read-write locks. Uh, so, you know, you have mutexes that essentially provide... Uh, you know, perfect scalability. Uh, the notion of a scalable mutex might sound like a, a misnomer, uh, but what I mean by a scalable mutex is under load, you want to saturate the system. You don't want to degrade performance. So, you know, uh, a typical lock that you'd see in libraries today is in, you know, one region of memory, and then you have a bunch of threads essentially spinning and, and or adaptively blocking on that lock. So you can imagine if you have, you know, uh, eight threads or uh, multiple cores, as you continue scaling that, you end up introducing a lot more cache currency traffic. And what ends up happening there is you end up degrading application performance and in some cases degrading system-wide performance as that load increases, right, as that lock becomes overloaded and you have contention. But you have locks out there, for example, which will ensure that uh, the system is just saturated uh, in that situation rather than degrading the performance. Uh, so these have been around for a very long time since uh, the early 90s, but they're not, uh, they haven't been put into active use outside of Java until recently. So Linux uh, uh, recently adopted uh, a lock known as uh, the MCS lock. And then you also have alternatives for uh, condition variables, read-write locks. Uh, you have read-write locks that provide perfect scalability. And then you have all sorts of ways to uh, handle biasing for these locks. So most locks that we, we deal with today, a practitioner deals with today, uh, tend to be write bias locks, meaning those locks uh, uh, in the presence of contention will prefer writers over readers. And there are implications to this for a lot of applications. Uh, so you may want fairness. You may want to ensure that, uh, you know, uh, reads uh, and incoming lock acquisition attempts are uh, serviced in a fair manner, maybe in the order in which those requests are received, or fair with respect to readers versus writers. Uh, so the beauty about a lot of these primitives is they're a plug and play. You could replace an existing lock and you'll get uh, you know, performance uh, benefits for free. Uh, so, you know, it's very practical. While still having the same semantics. If you get your shared writer mutex lock, then you know you're safe to write to this memory or whatever. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, there may be trade-offs with some of them with regards to fast path latency or memory usage. Uh, but then you do have also alternatives that, you know, where there are essentially minimal trade-offs in those regards. Uh, and then, you know, other, I'd say last, last two things that I, I, I you know, touched on here. Uh, one is the topic of uh, memory management. So when, um, you know, when, when uh, building a concurrent and or uh, parallel system uh, involving uh, dynamic data structures, a very common thing is to, to decouple the liveness and reachability of objects and rely on things like reference counting in order to reduce uh, contention. Uh, however, reference counting itself tends to be extremely error prone. It's very, uh, uh, you know, it's very uh, complicated and there's a cost on the fast path because you're incrementing all these reference counts. So even an, even a read mostly workload, which is great for a parallel system, ends up becoming a write mostly workload if you're constantly incrementing and decrementing reference counts. Interesting. Uh, and if you're utilizing more advanced uh, uh, 
data structures like lock free data structures, traditional reference counting is not a good fit. So for a long time now, there's been a lot of work around safe memory reclamations that allow you, that are essentially alternatives to reference counting that also work for things like dynamic lock free data structures. So probably the most well known implementation there is read copy update or RCU of Paul McKinney uh, and EBR of Kira Frazier. Uh, EBR is used in concurrency kit and Rust. Uh, so the, the big thing with, with these techniques is for read mostly workloads, uh, they perform extremely well, they scale. And then the thing that I really like and I think is underappreciated is they're actually very simple. Uh, so in a lot of the stacks that I've, uh, I've worked on, we heavily make use of these and the whole uh, job of memory management is uh, handled by the core subsystems of the, of, the software, of the software platforms that I'm working on rather than the developer. So for example, at Backtrace, we have a Columnar database. If a developer is adding something like an HP endpoint, they don't have to worry about anything uh, around uh, memory management with respect to accessing concurrent data structures. They can just access anything, uh, any uh, pointer, dereference any pointer, and uh, you know the, all the reference counting is managed uh, by the, the core engine. Uh, and so I do highly recommend folks do take a look at those, not just for performance, but also for simplicity. Uh, you don't have the same issues as reference counting. Hmm. Do you want to tell us a little, a little bit more about the concurrency kit project that we mentioned in your bio? Yeah, sure. Uh, so that project was kicked off uh, several years ago. I was at the GW High Performance Computing Laboratory, and it was uh, it's designed to allow for uh, the design and implementation of high performance concurrent systems. Uh, it is released under the BSD license. Hmm. And the purpose of that project beyond enabling practitioners to make use of these techniques is to uh, support freestanding environments. So for example, it is actually uh, part of the uh, FreeBSD kernel at this point but also enable practitioners and academics to collaborate. Uh, what I found uh, during my time at the High Performance Computing Laboratory is you have all, these, all this great literature on multi-core synchronization, but A, you don't actually have production quality implementations for a lot of these algorithms, or B, it turns out a lot of these algorithms just don't make sense in the real world. Uh, so part of the goal of that project is also to serve as you know, sort of a, a central repository uh, for these algorithms and the reference implementations. So you have a, you have a whole bunch of lock implementations, read-write locks, uh, advanced data structures, etc. cetera. Uh, so just concurrencykit.org is uh, the homepage of the project, and again, it's uh, liberally licensed. It sounds uh, kind of like a proving ground, I guess, for these techniques. That's how it started out in the first month. And then what ended up happening is I needed concurrency kit for every single job that I've had and every real world system that I've built. And so did others. So now we have a very active community around it and it's, uh, it's heavily used. You know, you've probably all either seen an advertisement online or received a, a packet or an email that has uh, went through concurrency kit. Today. Interesting. Do you know if there's any plans, either by you or someone else involved with Concurrency Kit, to uh, propose them to the standard for C++? Uh, I personally do not have uh, plans. However, I do know that uh, a lot of other folks uh, have been investing there. So Paul McKenney, uh, who invented RCU, Magid Michael, who invented uh, the lock-free FIFO and, and hazard pointers, as well as a whole bunch of others, have been working uh, hard to modernize a set of concurrency primitives available to C++. Uh, so they have been involved uh, in transactional memory extensions uh, and incorporating RCU into the standard. Interesting. Yeah, I was just uh, thinking if you said some of these uh, primitives are used in the FreeBSD kernel, I think you said FreeBSD, um, 
then it's probably not written in C++ currently. Correct. So concurrency kit is in C99. Uh, however, uh, it is used in C++ software, so there are uh, large portions of it that are uh, compatible for incorporation into C++. Okay. Okay. Uh, do you have any advice for programmers who uh, want to get in, want to get working with uh, lock-free, multi-threaded programming? Yeah, sure. Uh, so you'll find some great introductory resources at the ACMQ. So while I go, I collaborated on an issue with uh, Paul McKenney of RCU, Maggot Michael, Matty Desnoyers. If you Google for non-blocking synchronization ACMQ, you'll find a, a great introductory guide and references to all these articles. Uh, if you're interested in reading resources, uh, two great resources are Paul McKenney's book, a uh, very long title, uh, Parallel programming is hard. Is uh, parallel programming is hard, and if so, what can you do about it? Something along those lines. <laughs> uh, great book. And another one is Nick Shavat, uh, Morris Hurley, a uh, bunch of folks who are sort of uh, uh, how can I say the the founding fathers and or heavily involved in uh, you know advanced synchronization or multi core systems wrote a book called The Art of Multi Process Programming. Uh, which is very accessible to practitioners, so it covers both theory and uh, and practice. Uh, so these these would be, uh, I think these are great starting points. Uh, and last but not least, you also have code out there. So uh, concurrency kit is written to be readable. You have a lot of comments. I do recommend checking it out. And what then an you interesting also uh, concept. <laughs> <laughs> comments, yeah. Yeah. Uh, style guides are, you know, there, there is a style guide too. Uh, and then you have URCU as well. Uh, so both, both are uh, fairly accessible. And you'll have references to papers, documentation, etc. So a bit off topic, if you don't mind, from actual concurrent programming, but you did just mention that there's a style guide. And that's something that's kind of come up a little bit on our show in previous episodes. And I'm curious if you do anything to enforce the style guide on that project. So in previous organizations, uh, we have integrated uh, the Clang formatter in mm -hmm. there. And you can essentially have a, a pre-commit hook that rejects something that uh, either doesn't respect the style guide or just automatically stylize anything that uh, prior to check-in. Uh, <clears throat> at Backtrace and for concurrency kit, we actually adopted the FreeBSD kernel or variant, sort of a, a mix between the FreeBSD kernel style guide and the Solaris kernel style guide. Uh, unfortunately, the portions you adopted from the FreeBSD kernel style guide uh, do not uh, cannot be handled by existing formatters. So what ends up happening is we have. Uh, Everyone is a style Nazi, right? <laughs> so in any code review, we'll, we'll essentially reject the review if style does not pass. How much uh, flexibility do you leave for, for pushing the rules of the style guide so that the code is more readable in a particular situation? Yeah, that is on a case-by-case -case basis. So there are okay. cases where the style guide does not make sense, and, uh, you know, these are pointed out during the, the review. Interesting. Yeah, that, I was curious about that. Thank you. Yeah. I was uh, looking at the Backtrace blog before we got you on, and I saw that you spoke recently as a keynoter, I think, at GlueCon, and I had not heard of that conference. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about it. Sure. Uh, so I wasn't a keynoter there. Uh, no. no. Uh, I talked about debugging technology, so debugger internals, how they work. Uh, GlueCon was a great conference. It's in Broomfield, Colorado, a beautiful little town. That's a few okay. miles Close from Jason's I, hometown. I, I, had, I have no oh, idea cool. what you're talking about. So <laughs> <clears throat> I, was, I was pleasantly surprised. We had high-quality speakers there. Uh, it really – there wasn't a uh, – one theme to it, I would say. Uh, it was focused on technologies involved in microservices, uh, but, you know, really had a nice balance between operations, 
software development, etc. So you had, you know, something like my talk discussing, you know, assembly and low-level debugger internals to a talk, uh, you know, revolving around uh, deployment infrastructure to talks on, you know, best practices for microservices in Java. Uh, so there's a lot of variety there. I think it's a great conference uh, if you want to exchange ideas and or be exposed to, uh, you know, uh, different disciplines within within our field. I will uh, make a note of it. It looks like next year it may conflict with C++ now. I'm not positive, but... Um yeah, they were they were back to back. So I was at CPP now, and then the following week it was uh, Blue Pound. Okay. And yes, uh, I, I think that's your yeah. Okay. Sorry, what was that, Jason? It'll be the exact same situation next year. It's like the day after. So I, I know you have a hard stop in a few minutes, but before we let you go, any updates on Backtrace that you wanted to share with us? Yeah, a uh, whole bunch. Uh, so for those that aren't familiar. Backtrace is a plug-and-play crash reporting and crash management platform for natively compiled software, you know, uh, such as C++. Uh, so major focus uh, for us lately, uh, you know, we started off in the Unix server world. Now we've made a lot of investments for uh, a software running on Windows, Mac OS, uh, mobile. Uh, Backtrace is now running on things ranging from tablets to to uh, video games. Uh, so we've done a lot of great work on easing integration there, and we've made a lot of investments uh, to improve support for popular frameworks, such as uh, Chromium Embedded Framework, uh, eventing libraries used both in server-side and client-side, game engines, etc. Uh, recently, we exposed a new facet of the product called the Query Builder, which uh, takes full of advantage of uh, an embedded columnar engine that we've built for the purposes of better understanding the impact of crashes for triage and prioritization, as well as extracting patterns for better root cause investigation. So you could do things like, hey, give me a linear histogram of process up time for all unique crashes, or give me the distribution of faulting memory addresses, or sum by user impact or concurrent events, and let me triage and prioritize according to that uh, so it's, it's pretty pretty interesting stuff. We will be shooting out uh, a blog post discussing the internals of our embedded columnar database and why we built one to begin with as well. Uh, other than that, if uh, you're writing C++, I do highly recommend checking this out. Uh, should be easy to integrate. In my previous life, I was a mobile app developer, and uh, I worked on iOS and Android. I know we looked at, I think it was Raygun IO, which was a similar crash reporting service, but at least at the time, I don't think they had any support for C++. So you're now in there to fill that need in the mobile space? Correct. So we have first-class support for C++ uh, on pretty much any target. That's great. Okay, anything else uh, you want to share with us before we let you go? Uh, where can people find you online? Oh, sure. Uh, you know, I, I have a horrible Twitter handle. <laughs> it's uh, zero or OXF390 uh, is my Twitter handle. Uh, or just search my name and you'll find me. Uh, and my website is repnop.org. And if you want to learn more about Backtrace, it's backtrace.io. And you'll find my contact information there as well. Okay, great. It's been great having you on today, Sammy. Yeah, thank you all for your time. Thanks for joining us. Take care. Thanks so much for listening in as we chat about C++. I'd love to hear what you think of the podcast. Please let me know if we're discussing the stuff you're interested in. Or if you have a suggestion for a topic, I'd love to hear about that too. You can email all your thoughts to feedback at cppcast.com. I'd also appreciate if you like cppcast on Facebook and follow cppcast on Twitter. You can also follow me at Rob W. Irving and Jason at Leftkiss on Twitter. And of course, you can find all that info and the show notes on the podcast website at cppcast.com. Theme music for this episode is provided by podcastthemes.com. website at cppcast.com. Theme music for this episode is provided by podcastthemes.com.